Hello everyone, and thanks for returning. Um, this is episode two of Sound Scene, and today we're looking at the music in the documentary films by BBC journalist Adam Curtis, called Hypernormalization from 2016 and Can't Get You Out of My Head, which came out in February this year. The films are these equal parts beautiful and harrowing patchwork quilts of human history that attempt to show exactly how we got into this little old mess that we call the present day. They're non-partisan, which is nice, uh, they're critical, but they're also hopeful, and the films seem to be portentously birthed exactly when the world needs them. But onto the music he uses in his films, which are an aficionado's wet dream with the likes of Burial, Aphex Twin, Brian Eno, and even a German cover of There Is A Light That Never Goes Out. And it's not just the obscurity of the artist, it's the overall textual contribution to this aforementioned patchwork quilt. The music is sometimes complementary to what we're watching, but sometimes fucking jarring, and a song might play for one minute or seven seconds, and it'll jump from 20th century Chinese opera to guttural, obtuse techno. So to gain some kind of context behind the chaos, uh, today I'm speaking with Gavin Miller, who has been a part of both Hypernormalization and Can't Get You Out of My Head, as music supervisor as well as contributing music uh, of his own under his own project called Worried About Satan, all one word, so Worried About Satan. Um, I found that so many of the songs I was shazamming during the documentary were Gavin's, so I was really stoked to chat to him and understand the process some more. But one last thing before we jump into it. So I can't state how much you should watch these documentaries if you haven't seen them yet. Um, Not just for the message, which will knock you for six, but Adam Curtis uses music in his documentaries like nothing I've seen in a documentary before. He's like a flamboyant chef with his ingredients in the kitchen, you know, spicing it up on the palate. A bit of saccharin here jazz it up over there. He knows when to go for simplicity and then when to really knock you over unexpectedly. And like any great chef, and yes, I'm I'm still trying to keep this analogy going because when you have a good one, it feels good. Um, He still has total command over the dish as a whole. And he serves it with a finish that leaves you quite bereft, but also wanting more. Super inspiring stuff. Anyway, before this becomes a food podcast, let's get into it. Sounds Scene. Sounds Scene. Hello there. Welcome to Sound Scene, a podcast about how music supervisors use music to tell visual stories. Sounds Scene. Hey, Gavin. Hey, how's it going? I'm good, thank you. How you doing? Yeah, I'm all good. I'm all good. So let's start with just how, how long have you worked with and known Adam Curtis? Um, I guess it all started in about 2011, um, which came as a bit of a surprise because I, I, I was looking today to see when I'd first talked to him. and I was convinced it was about, you know, a couple of months ago or like a couple of years ago. And it turned out it was like over a decade ago. So, <laughs> so that was quite a, a bit of an eye opener. But yeah, it was uh, around like 2011. It was kind of, I, I'd... Um, approached him just to do an interview for a blog that I was writing for um and to my surprise he kind of said yes so it kind of just went from there I guess just you know we kind of kept in touch and you know that that led to um, my kind of involvement in his films now I guess for sure and and now I'm interviewing you about the input that you had in in his films so I apologize (laughs) for the irony of that um (laughs) it's fine yeah I never thought of that that's that's a good way (laughs) but yes as you said this led to you contributing some of your own music um, and, and and also lending a hand as music supervisor. So was that just kind of this org- organic thing that that snowballed after you you initially spoke? Yeah, definitely. I think not many people had really asked him about how music how how his music taste um, you know it reflects and impacts on his on his documentaries and stuff. And I think he was just bored to be honest with you. Like <laughs> I think when I spoke to him, I think I could definitely tell that. Uh, that he was just like waiting for someone to just ask him about the music. But uh, yeah, so it, it, we, we just, we hit it off and I, I just happened to, well, I, obviously I mentioned I was in a band and I, I was doing this kind of interview for a for a blog I, I was doing stuff for. So I think he just, he, he was running out of kind of 
tracks that he wanted to use and he just wanted to bounce ideas off somebody. So mm. if I remember rightly, he just said one day, or he just emailed me one day and said, can you just send me some stuff? Just send me anything that you think I might like. Uh, and having spoken to him and interviewed him, I kind of got an idea about what it is that he wants to put in in films and stuff and how if I'd heard something, I, I, you know, a light bulb would go off and I think, okay, yeah, he'd like that because, you know, there's a, there's a big like dread note and, you know, he can overlay that with something else and stuff. So uh, basically all my job was, was to kind of uh, just go through my iTunes or just, just listen to stuff that I would, I would normally be exposed to put it all in a big file and just send it to him and just say like, Hey man, here you go. Like have, you know, all this. And over time I kind of, I put a bit more of my stuff in there obviously because, I'm not like a big artist or anything. I'm, I'm not, I don't have like a big um, industry behind me. I don't have like, you know, managers or labels or anything like that. So I thought like, well, this is, this is kind of my, my, uh, <laughs> <It's> my shot. <laughs> my, the only thing that I've got really <laughs> as a band. So I thought, you know, okay, fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll just slide him stuff I do as I do it, you know. Um, and I guess like he really liked the Satan stuff anyway, because he was putting it in all of his, in all in all of his newer in newer shows so like, i kept him up to date and over years the years that go by i kind of i just send him stuff as i do it and then it, it kind of pops up now and again and um you know some of the stuff that i send him it just never appears anywhere and then other stuff like he'll just take this one bit of this one thing but i had no idea i'd even given him and he, <laughs> he'll constantly you know play that on a loop and i was like oh okay <laughs> that's how it works then um so yeah it was it was just like it's a really it's a really strange way of working, I suppose. It's, it, I, I don't think it's it's kind of like because a few people have been in touch asking me about like you know the supervision and but I was kind of I had to explain to them like kind of what how it works with me and Adam is not is probably not what a usual a, a, su- a music supervisor would do usually. And I, I used to work in mm-hmm. TV anyway, so I kind of know like the a, a few kind of ins and outs of like how it works and you know with clearances and yeah. reporting and stuff like that. So. Um, I, can, I kind of have to remind myself as well that like it's not I guess it, on, on paper it's not strictly like music supervision but it, I guess it's like the closest thing to it um, for sure he kind of I, I think it's more like he just wants to bounce ideas off somebody so like he'll have a few people that he speaks to I think if, um, Robert Del Naja from Massive Attacks another one that he kind of he's in contact with and he just wants he just wants to be exposed to music that we both kind of like, or we, you know, we're on the same wavelength with. So I think it's nice that he just kind of, he has all, he has this little, little cabal, <laughs> I guess, of, of people, but for, especially for hypernormalization, I think I was a bit more kind of involved in the, um, the, the kind of scouting, I suppose, of, right. of tracks and music for him. Right. Um, and then that's how like he kind of, he gave me that credit at the end for music supervisor, just because I was, I think I'd probably given him more than other people. I'm, I mean, right, right. I'm, I'm guessing like, you know, 3D from Massive Attack can come in and say like, no, I gave him loads, you know, but <laughs> as far as I'm aware, I, I, I was the only one that kind of gave him like quite a lot of stuff to work with on that. Yeah, one. yeah. No, that's that's really cool to hear. And, and I guess like Adam was, as you say, probably just one tired of talking about the same shite with journalists on on the, <laughs> yeah, on sure. his project that he's laboured over for so many years, and and two probably just really excited to talk with someone about the musical side of things, which he obviously cares uh, a lot about. Uh, and I guess he he does seem rather enigmatic, and what you've kind of just said does uh, confirm that in a sense. Um, yeah, <laughs> it just seems quite hard to place as this kind of peripheral. BBC renegade slash luminary or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But how would you kind of describe the process of of working as his his music supervisor, for want of a better word, but not only with this distinctive style that is imbued into his documentaries, but also as this person who has a seemingly very scrupulous command over each of his bodies of work. Yeah, um, he basically, um, he, I mean, he is like kind of the, the ultimate in a one-man band. Like he does everything. I mean, in the interview that I, I did with him, he did say that he doesn't, he, he never wants to work with um, like a composer to do to do music for the films because he wants mm. like, I, I think he wouldn't be able to get the kind of um, reaction out of um, out out of viewers that 
with just working with one person. He wants like kind of to to mash it all into this big kind of pop culture, um, like kind of melting pot thing. He wants to throw it all in there and then just like you know whip it round. And I guess he's very wary of 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 kind of putting too too much stuff out there. He'd rather kind of sit back on the sidelines and just kind of like throw something on the iPad and go, there you go. Like, what do you make of that? Um, and I think that that is kind of cool, especially the, these days. Like, um, yeah, there is that danger of kind of over sharing stuff or over kind of, you know, putting yourself out there a bit too much. So it's quite nice that he's just got this weird kind of like, like you say, like this renegade guy that's just running around the BBC archive, mm. like collecting all these clips and, you know, and, and stitching them all together to, to create these like weird little, these weird little worlds that he kind of he kind of makes. Yeah, so. no, that's cool, and 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 really interesting what you said about him not choosing to work with a composer, um, almost because that composer might take umbrage at him slashing up his piece into a million different yeah, pieces or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I guess I suppose you're not entirely sure what your music or or the music that you suggest to him is going to be backdropped against, and and sometimes. The results may be shocking, I imagine. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I like uh, people. People kind of say as well, "Oh, you, you didn't know that your stuff was going in." And <sighs> I have to say, each time I have absolutely no idea what these things are going to be. <laughs> like the the only I, I saw him in, I think it was about March 2019. I think we're playing a show in London, and he turned up and he said that he just finished this series, which I'm assuming is "Can't Get You Out of My Head." Um, and he said, "Oh, you know, I've just I've just put the finishing touches to this uh, this six part series." And I was like, "Oh, wow, brilliant!" And obviously, like nothing happens for a year and a bit, and then you know, he just like kind of randomly comes out with it. I'm like, "Oh, Christ, yeah, of course that thing." <laughs> but like, yeah, like I um, and some of the stuff I send him, like I, I was sending him huge files of just like um, stuff like maybe like Brian Eno or um, obviously some of my stuff or like kind of ambient y stuff mm. that I thought like, oh, you know, home run, he's definitely going to use this. And I think out of all the stuff I sent him, there was one, there was kind of the usual suspects that I knew he'd already have, like the the Satan stuff and the burial and the Nine Inch Nails. Mm. And there was just, there was there was a few other bits that he'd used that I sent him. And then I thought like, wow, he's he's being really like sparse with uh, things that I've sent him. <laughs> but like, he, he'd use this tiny bit of a, a Harold Budd and Brian Eno track. And I was like, yes, finally, <laughs> I've, got, I've got something on there that I sent him that wasn't mine. Brilliant. <laughs> But yeah, so like I think he just kind of has this big bank of of music that he kind of puts everything into, and then just like kind of you know just goes through and goes no 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 okay I'll use a bit of that and you know tiny bit of this tiny bit of that and you know that kind of thing. So I I just I loved it. I thought it was really really cool the way he kind of he took like so much stuff and kind of jammed it all together and he was he was melding like intros from Satan tracks and putting them next to um like nine inch nail stuff or, or you wow. know burial stuff or, or all this other kind of stuff and i was like wow holy holy god <laughs> <laughs> like he really knows his stuff he really knows how to kind of get this response out of you by kind of layering it all it's really really strange but for sure um yeah yeah it's just it's just it's a weird way of working but it's it's really nice at the end at, in the end definitely and yeah i mean this this style of working over several years uh, sporadic interactions at gigs and that kind of thing. Um, it to me, it feels more like art. It, it's it feels like something that can't really be rushed or made to meet a deadline in a typically journalistic sense. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. And like, kind of ne- needs to breathe its own life. Would you Would you say that the documentaries are, are a piece of art in that sense? Like, in your in your opinion, or, or if not art, maybe a, an historical artifact? No, yeah, absolutely. I think they're they're really one of a kind. Um, I don't know of anyone else really that does the kind of the, the the films that he does because because there's no like um there's no talking head stuff and there's no um you know reenactment stuff it's just archive footage put together so like as soon as you start to do that you you are creating a bit of a world because you're not shooting anything you're not going mm-hmm. out and and recording anything you're not interviewing anybody it's it's basically just what can you find in this massive archive and when you start to stitch it together they, they don't look or feel like anything else. If you watch a Netflix documentary, it's all in like beautiful glistening 4K and there's, you know, <laughs> talking head interviews with all these people and it's very artfully lit and it's a beautiful little piano soundtrack and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And they're great, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, it, it's horses for courses. I can sit and watch them all day. But like when you watch a Curtis thing, you think it it, it feels so much different from, from all of that. And it's mm. basically just because he kind of, 
he has a story and he has these essays planned out and he has these kind of things that he wants to tell you about that you might not know about. Like when I was watching Can't Get You Out of My Head, I didn't, I barely knew anything of, of this, like kind of this history. It was almost like a secret history he was kind of right. revealing. But you put them up against these kind of Netflix documentaries and you think like one, the, the, the scale of them as well is massive because it goes over decades and different continents and countries and ideologies and stuff. Whereas the kind of the more mainstream documentaries are just about, you know, just a very, uh, like smaller subject matter. And I guess like when you watch something like Can't Get You Out of My Head, you, you really like kind of get thrown in at the deep end because there's no, there's no like kind of intro and like nice hushed kind of uh, voiceover or anything like that. It's just kind of like, here you go, bang, like we're in, like, you know, sure. you, you're coming with me now. I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey here. Yeah. And I'm going to show you like all this stuff uh, that you might not know about. And I'm not going to dress it up. Here's here's the actual footage. Bang. Like, you know, one after the other, just like kind of, and it is a bit overwhelming sometimes. You sit back and you think, oh my God, like, this is crazy. Like, yeah. how did I not know about this? Or like, <laughs> why, well, you know, this is crazy. Like, what the hell? But it's great that he doesn't, he doesn't pull any punches really. Like, obviously he has something that he wants to tell you, something that he's written. They are like kind of like visual essays, I guess. Mm. Like, it is very much like, um, he, you know, he is telling you a story but it's a story based in fact. And, you know, uh, whereas some other, you know, documentaries might want to kind of, I don't know, sugarcoat a few things or skip around a few others right. with the Adam Curtis stuff. It's, it's, it's literally like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this and I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna make you feel good or bad about watching it. You, you're gonna have to feel something, but I'm just gonna throw you in there. So like, here it is, you know, cut up all this stuff, put it together done this the voiceover and some of the transitions and stuff and like yeah he does make you feel awkward and he does make you feel sad or happy you know yeah. he'll, he'll take you on a you know a range of emotions and stuff and sometimes i'm laughing as well at some of the oh, stuff yeah. because like like when he was playing that krista bird track and i was like oh my god like you know this is like the most brutal stuff you can you can picture and it was like uh like like isis or something but like soundtracked by lady in red and you're like oh, what the <laughs> what the hell like this is, this is absolutely crazy but it, it fits as part of his like kind of world where he'll take stuff you know big pop culture stuff and just marry it to these like you know these really brutal images and this really like crazy um story that he's taking you on but it's all linked somehow and it you know it, it all comes together and it's yeah it's 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 crazy but like i guess that's why they take so long to make because oh, he has yeah. to get it all just right like he can't just like you know i don't even know where i would how how to start on making like 30 seconds of that kind of footage it would just be so yeah totally yeah yeah but yeah. you do you do hit on a point there of it being kind of overwhelming but also like as soon as you're starting to watch it you're in it and you're you're kind of there and it's and it's yeah. easy to yeah. watch in a sense um but also on that point that you made about this objectivity and, and documentaries usually demand a certain objectivity, you know, presentation of facts, um, especially from, I would say, the narration and the visuals. Um, and Curtis also describes himself like rather understatedly as an emotional television journalist. Yeah, yeah. So therein kind of lies his adherence to objectivity journalistic integrity as as loaded a term as that is these days um but we kind of accept that what he's presenting to us in the images and certainly his narration are, are entrenched in or at least erring on on the side of fact but if we then go to the music it's it's another story i i feel like it it really effectively does the manipulation if we want to call it that that the other elements can't yeah. um in an interview he says of his musical choices what i do is try to create the mood that emulates the tone of the words that i'm saying um and he also kind of says that he wants to avoid that documentary trope of using say money by pink floyd in a documentary about <laughs> finance or whatever um yeah yeah sure yeah so, so I, I get what he's saying there but I, I feel like curtis's theory is also like why not use music in the same way that dramatic film or television uses it with emotional net resonance um, as a narrative device and even just to to reel a viewer in so i'm curious gavin like what role do you think the music plays in in, in adam curtis's films uh, yeah it's it, it's a massive kind of part of it definitely i think because it's all archive footage and there's no 
it's all stuff that has existed. It's not stuff that he goes out to make and you know puts all puts it all together. It's obviously it's all silent. So you, you have to kind of like you have to kind of create some kind of atmosphere. You want to take the viewer on a kind of I know it sounds a bit cliche, but you do want to take them on a bit of a journey. So like you have to try and make people feel what it is that you're saying and what it is that you're trying to get across. And because it's all archive footage, it's very difficult to do that because it's news broadcast from the time or it's a documentary from the time. It's all silent. So like, how do you do that? How else, how else can you telegraph to people, you know, this is, you know, this is bad or this is sad or like kind of, uh, this is a bit of a gray area, like make your, make your own mind up or this is a bit weird. This is a bit crazy. Like, and it's, it's very hard to do that, especially, um, especially the way he works because I guess sometimes like if, if you do make a more mainstream documentary, you can kind of say to your composer or your music guy, like, you know, just get me something sad and they'll just go out and find like um, a nice little neoclassical thing. It'll be like, okay, yeah, let's just bang that in. That sounds about right. But with Adam being who he is and like the way he thinks about stuff, he doesn't want to just get sucked into that kind of world of, um, you know, I'll, well, I will just Google sad music and I will just find something and I'll just bang it on. And there you go. He wants to find like the kind of sadness in something that's happy or something that's happy and something that's sad. You know, he wants to find like kind of, when I interviewed him, he was talking about like 60s pop music and, and the way they kind of communicate different emotions and different kind of feelings in a really happy pop song. So you listen to kind of like the Ronettes or something like that or um maybe you know some motown stuff or some of the kind of um more poppy kind of radio friendly stuff from the 50s and 60s and maybe 70s and if you look at the lyrics on paper they're they're, they're pretty brutal <laughs> sometimes it can be really like not what you would expect you know you listen it's like la, yeah. da, 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 da. but the, the the lyrics are kind of like yeah like you left it's me harrowing. you ah, you know all this kind of stuff you're like whoa okay <laughs> And I think he's really, he's more interested in yeah. finding finding that kind of vibe, that kind of atmosphere in something that's, you know, a happy pop song. He wants to find, dig, drill down into that kind of like melancholy or that kind of weirdness. Or mm. if you if you marry it to the images that he's presenting you with, it kind of creates um, something new, something something that you've not maybe not thought about before. So like, yeah, these these happy pop songs, some of them are quite sad. Like when you when you look at the lyrics or um some of them will just sound strange but he'll find that one yeah. little bit maybe it's just a backing track or something or like a tiny a tiny element of like an old you know ronette's tune or something and he'll put that in he, he, he's more interested in finding that than just saying right just go and find me some sad piano music and i'll you know bung that on and i'll just loop it for a bit and it'll be fine it's more way more interesting to kind of go out there and find something that you wouldn't necessarily think of when 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 you put all this stuff together for his stuff, he needs something a bit more. Yeah. Like sometimes he'll, he'll kind of layer different tracks over each other and it'll create this really like horrible clash or like this atonal kind of weirdness. And if you listen to it in, um, in isolation, if you just listen to those two things over each other, you'd be like, ah, God, that's horrible. But when you kind of put it over with his narration, with the images you see, it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes like this weird, everything kind of comes together and it kind of makes this little, this little moment. Yeah. Um, but it just kind of elevates it a bit more and it kind of makes you feel something a bit more. So yeah, the way he does that is it's, it's really strange, but like it's, it's, yeah, no one else, no one else really does it. it. No one else really knows how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And and on the podcast, uh, I like to talk a lot about how combining the visual with music can create like just a a net new thing. And and he really does that by, by stitching it together. And I, I think what you touched on there about, the music is is really true and and i suppose what he is maybe getting at there is that it's it's human like nothing is just sad it's it's always sad imbued with a bit of happiness or, or whatever absolutely and yeah i i was thinking yeah. when you were just talking about the renettes like one of my uh favorite songs to dance to when i'm really drunk is uh teardrops by womack and womack and oh okay yeah, yeah yeah when you listen to the lyrics of that is it is actually just really heartbreaking but i'm like yeah great song yeah <laughs> I was chatting to my friend actually kind of about the music in these documentaries as being important to the point of of manipulative and, and engineering kind of the emotional qualities that Adam wants the audience to derive from a particular scene or, or moment or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. And well, he, he distilled it into two kind of parts. Like one was this moody, uh, 
dystopian kind of hypnosis uh, by virtue of Burial, Aphex Twin, Brian Eno, etc. Um, yeah, yeah. Which kind of f- favours concentration, but also really affects the tone with this ominous but melancholy and solastalgia and, and, and stuff. And then also a, a kind of Tarantino-esque irony with his like punk songs and rock yeah, songs, yeah. all these big operatic numbers, sort of showing this hopeful anger of of the people, but used in moments where you feel like the message being touted is, is an already dead fantasy. Like, how, how would you describe the music in the films? Like, we've talked about the role, but more like, what is it that he uses? Yeah, yeah. I, I, before I started working with him, he'd obviously done like quite a lot of um, films before. Um, and I'm guessing he just has a big library of stuff that he's listened to, you know, what he thinks will be good to use when you watch something new it'll just t- totally take you by surprise and just play like you like you said like a punk song or these kind of russian protest songs or something and i'm like how the hell did you find that like that's you know that's that's amazing but um it is very definitely split into kind of two camps like the kind of the, you know quote unquote background music which is like your apexes and stuff like that and then when he wants to kind of elevate it a little bit more he will just reach for like like you said like if there's a particularly angry kind of scene happening it makes sense to find something that marries that kind of anger or matches that emotion. So yeah, like he'll find kind of punk songs or just like really random, like prog songs, you know, stuff like that. And he doesn't know a lot about music mm. and he knows like what he wants to do and like, and he knows that it's a very important thing. So he d- there's, there's never any just settling for any less. It, it's always just like, well, if he hears something, then I guess something goes off in his brain and he'll just say, right, yeah, I've got yeah. to use that because that's, that that represents what I'm trying to say about you know such and such or you know this that and the other. Like obviously he's a, he's a fan of like the kind of um, atmospheric electronic stuff, but just as much he he likes the kind of you know like you said like the Tarantino style kind of pop songs. And I guess like there is similarities because Tarantino uses there is like on a, on one level that kind of irony of using like quite a happy happy go lucky you know twangy guitar song right uh, over something that's super violent or super heavy. But you, you, the the kind of emotion or the vibe or the kind of atmosphere of it kind of fits. So like, it, if it works, it works. Like, if, mm. if it doesn't work, you will know. So yeah, I definitely think there's kind of there's two kind of distinct camps that he uses, and it's up to him where to kind of splice stuff in or where to where to put stuff that that, that will give that kind of more resonance to it. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really good point, and and that distinction you made is really good because I feel like Tarantino obviously operating in the world of fiction can be a bit more garish and maybe fun with it. But when, yeah, when Adam does it, it's more, uh, I, I guess he's, it, he's putting it against some pretty shocking footage, but it's never seen to be inappropriate or something that yeah, maybe exactly, a cultural yeah, reference yeah. or whatever, but as you say, it just kind of works, you know? Yeah. It, he manages to kind of spin this really sinister side of stuff that you would never think would have a sinister side, but it kind of does, <laughs> like, but yeah. like you were saying earlier, like it, it's come from a human emotion. The music's all come from like somebody sitting down and writing like a song. So you know, it might be like a heartbreak song. Someone's gone through it and think, oh, you know, I've got to, you know, I'm going to write about this today. And sometimes, like, kind of sadness or like melancholy or something like that will kind of filter into stuff that is quite happy or on one level sounds quite happy. But if you drill down a little bit you know, someone's being quite sad or someone's a bit upset or someone is going through a range of emotions and it's not quite black and white. It's kind of somewhere in the middle and it's finding that kind of, that kind of weirdness that just sits under the kind of surface level. It's finding that weirdness underneath and just bringing it out and just putting it to these, these things, these like visuals that you would never kind of expect. It's really, it's like this kind of, it is quite overwhelming sometimes, but like the way he kind of uses that to his advantage it's great. I'm sure his like musical arsenal is massive <laughs> like, and he just kind of, you know, just he knows what he wants to go for and he just like kind of, you know, picks and chooses it or tweaks it a little bit. So, yeah, it's yeah. nice that that he can do that, I guess. No, that's that's really beautifully put. I love that, Gavin. That's really good. So on on the logistical side, um, I mean, God knows the number of songs <laughs> <laughs> that end, end up in, in the final project, but um do you do you know the number that you were that that were getting licensed and cleared? Uh, no, the, I think one of the reasons he really likes working with the BBC is the blanket license, so he doesn't have mm. to go out and 
uh, and you know argue with uh, sync agents or publishers and stuff like that. He can just use whatever he wants whenever he wants, and that gives him that freedom to just think, you know, oh, you know, we haven't got the rights to such and such. Oh, you know, I'll have to settle for something else. It's very much like I can use whatever I want. So I have no idea how many, how much he used in in the rec- in the recent films. Um, but yeah, logistically, it makes it a lot easier because he only does stuff with the BBC. Um, when it's shown not on the BBC, yes. like obviously you get into a lot of trouble if you haven't cleared stuff and it kind of, it, it does, I guess that's why like not many people touch it, like broadcasters touch it overseas, which is why it's weird because then it, it kind of forces people to watch it not so legally. Like if you, you know, you get a stream of it or you get a download of it, it's just, it, it, it makes it, it makes it harder for broadcasters to play, play by the, play by the rules, I guess. Because they do have to go out and I mean a cue sheet for hypernormalization. I can't imagine what a mess that would look like. It would just be, <laughs> uh, you know, every other minute it would be like another tiny clip of something overlaid over another clip of something else. That so like, I mean, I used to do that for ITV. I used to work in the um, the reporting, the music reporting stuff. Uh, and so for like mainstream films, it was great because it was just like you know, here's here's the score, score, score. Here's a here's a track at the end. Brilliant. Okay, you know, that's fine. Something like hypernormalization, I'd you know, it'd keep you up at night. It would, just, it would, you'd never get it done. It would just be insane. So, like, I guess that's a good thing about working with the BBC that they do have that that blanket license, so he doesn't have to clear everything. But right, and then does that just get handled on a on an administrative side on their end, basically? Yeah, I I can imagine he maybe, uh, I mean, maybe he does have to submit a cue sheet for it. But I'm I'm not sure, but. Yeah, the BBC will kind of, it, you know, if you get if you get broadcast, then you will. I mean, it, because it's on the iPlayer, like you get like zero point one one one, you know, zero 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 one p per like you know per ten minutes of, of of streaming or something like that. It's ridiculous, but but it obviously kind of in the long run, it, it it's kind of you know pros and cons. You're on an Adam Curtis thing, like you know, there's you have to weigh it up mm. against that, I suppose. But, but as long um, as long as you are getting your royalties, Gavin. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting that, that tiny slice of a penny every time. <laughs> nice one. No, but what you mentioned there is cool. Like he said in an interview that it, it's simply easier for him to get a blanket license that clears stuff in the UK, but that's why the release is, is done thusly, like just in the UK and, and watching it outside of the UK is a bit harder. Yeah. Um, so he's done that from like a convenient, uh, a place of convenience, I suppose, but... It's interesting that music is kind of this one blocker that allows for easier and wider sharing, like that that it is music is kind of what has also propelled it to be more mm. kind of cultish and um, also for them to fly under the radar to some, yeah, to some yeah. degree. Yeah, definitely. I, I think with the kind of music rights stuff, it's obviously if somebody in America wants to watch it or somebody in Europe wants to watch it or, you know, anywhere wants to watch it. It does make it difficult if they don't have, uh, if you don't have something like the BBC because, because of the blanket license, it makes it really easy to watch it here, really hard to watch it anywhere else. So, uh, I, I, I mean, I'd like to think people understand that there is, there is method behind that. Like musicians do need to get paid for like what they do because like, otherwise they won't be able to do what they do. And I, Sometimes you have to remind yourself of that and, and remind other people of that as well, because, you know, especially on stuff like YouTube, people will kind of whinge about, um, you know, copyright uh, blockers and stuff like taking the money for music if you, if, you, if you use a piece of music and stuff. And sometimes you do have to just sit down and say, well, yeah, you've used their music. They, they are entitled to something because they've made the music. Like it's not, <laughs> you can't just get away with making a massive video putting it on YouTube for like, you know, thousands of people to watch and then expecting the music to just like aid you in, 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 in telling a story or, or, or making a video and then not giving anything back. It's like, well, yeah, like I'm a musician. I mean, I don't do it full time, but like if you use my stuff, it, you know, would be nice if I got like, <laughs> you know, at least a bit of something. And it's like the exposure argument only kind of goes so far. Cause I mean, I don't do this as a living, but whatever money that does come in that, you know, might pay a bill here yeah. or it might, you know, if I need to upgrade, the, you know, bits of studio equipment, I can do it because, you know, I, I've gotten, you know, someone's bought my stuff or, you know, I've got that royalty check or something like that. So 
it's kind of i mean i do understand to a degree it is like kind of weighing it <laughs> weighing up one to the other and there is a bit of a gray area and it's it's not easily explained but like i don't know like <laughs> musicians need to get paid basically <laughs> like, you just have to kind of jump through these hoops i suppose if, if you want the best possible outcome yeah i suppose it is a, a little like conflicting in that sense i mean for one it, it's why i kind of want to do this podcast to just increase the the awareness of this around it not not just for you know um everyday folk but people that even work in these industries for, to be more aware of of this process and, and also the value exchange and yeah yeah i think there's a huge education piece there just for the value of music you can clearly see it in this documentary and it, it, even for people that you know starting up a blog or just have a youtube channel and yeah yeah want to use your song for their you know, mash together highlights footage of Lionel Messi doing free kicks or whatever. You're kind of like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, yeah, you've yeah. got to you know, pay for this or you've got to, you know, get the rights. For yeah, it. sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, hey, Gavin, I, I really enjoyed talking to you just now. Yeah, um, me too, yeah. It's been really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no worries. For those wanting to know more about Gavin's work, you can find him by searching Worried About Satan, again, all one word. The Adam Curtis documentaries are available in the UK on BBC iPlayer and on YouTube. And if you're in a different country, I suppose half the fun is trying to find them. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. No worries. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks again, guys, for listening. Um, we'll have another episode in two weeks, so subscribe on your podcast app of choice or follow us on Instagram or Twitter at sounds underscore scene. Uh, the next episode is super exciting with Megan Currier. She's a music supervisor that works with Randall Poster, who's been Wes Anderson's music supervisor for years since Bottle Rocket. Um, but me and Megan had a really great chat just about a number of different projects she worked on, but particularly uh, Waves, which is a great film by director Trey Schultz, Trey Edward Schultz. So I'll see you then. Uh, take care. Much love. Ciao. Sounds sweet.